Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast, episode number one. How one vision can impact the world, the microscope of pioneer Karl Zeiss. I'm thriving for a deeper understanding. So already as a kid, I was so curious about how the earth and the oceans function or how people function and why things the, are the way they are. So to me, um, curiosity is actually the, the, the greatest force in, in my being and in my work that I do. To understand our world, we humans look at it. Our curiosity comes from what we see and we try to see more than what is visible. This urge to enhance the human eye has been at the heart of science for centuries. And it was also the vision of Karl Zeiss. The young entrepreneur wanted to challenge the limits of imagination and founded in 1846 what was to become a global player, Zeiss. Now, 175 years later and on the occasion of the company anniversary, I am very happy to welcome you to Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast. My name is Yasmin Blair, and in episode one of this podcast, we will have a look at how it all started. The very beginning of Zeiss lies within one instrument, the production of a precise microscope based on a scientific foundation. How did one idea of building a predictable tool to enhance human eyesight, to see more than what is visible, become the driving force of an internationally leading enterprise? To have a closer look at the historic moment, as well as its impact on research microscopy until today, we spoke to Dr. Michael Albitz, head of Zeiss Microscopy, as well as marine microbiologist and deep-sea explorer, Professor Antje Buitius. Together, we discuss how research and innovation supplement each other and why this relationship is so firmly rooted in the very beginning of Zeiss. Building on this tradition, we ask, how can we challenge the limits of imagination for a better future? The young Carl Zeiss was asking himself the same question back in 1846 when he opened a small workshop for precision mechanics and optical instruments in the university town Jena. Originally from Weimar, the 30-year-old trained mechanic returned to the town after his journeyman years because it was a vibrant place for mechanics, watchmakers and tradesmen. Many of them worked at least partly in science and needed tools like glasses or telescopes. Yet, Karl Zeiss knew that if he wanted to properly get his foot in the door, he would need a personal network, a customer base of scientists. Since he had studied in Jena, he had good connections to the university. Now, this enabled him to work directly with researchers and to produce tools according to their needs. In summer of 1847, only a few months after opening the doors to his workshop in Jena's Neugasse No. 7, Karl Zeiss's attention was drawn to the simple microscope by his former teacher. A simple microscope is a tool containing just one lens. As the demand in these optical instruments was rising in biological and medical research at the time, Zeiss sold his first microscope shortly after. Soon, his small business enjoyed a good reputation amongst scientists due to the meticulous workmanship of his products. Zeiss could hire his first apprentices. At the beginning of the 1850s, the demand for optical instruments was growing faster as modern medicine was on the verge of entering the modern era. Medical researchers were increasingly interested in compound microscopes, a microscope with multiple lenses. But there was a decisive problem. Carl Zeiss found very early after founding his company that it's basically impossible to build microscopes in a reproducible manner in high quality because he actually didn't understand the theory or nobody understood the theory of optics behind this whole process. So, so the process he had to use was a trial and error process and he wanted to break this 
uh, in order to build reliable microscopes. That was Dr. Michael Albitz, head of Zeiss Microscopy. With a PhD in physics from the Ruprecht Karls University in Heidelberg, he started his career like many of his colleagues in science before he joined Zeiss 15 years ago. So this is why I started working with, with Ernst Abbe in 1866 to develop the theory of optical imaging. And this took some years, but in 1872, Ernst Abbe's research results allowed him to build the highest performing and by far the highest performing microscopes in a very reproducible manner on the basis of Abbe's math mathematical calculations for the very first time. This partnership between Zeiss and Abbe was the first partnership between Zeiss as a company and academic researchers, and we are still building on all these inputs from outside to build high-performing, high-quality microscopes until today. By recruiting researchers, Carl Zeiss interlinked what used to be strictly separated for a long time, science and industry. And it was this connection that turned out to be the key ingredient for his success. Zeiss made Abbe his business partner in 1876 and appointed him to take over as head of the company. To attract and to keep highly qualified employees motivated, Zeiss and Abbe did not only improve optical instruments, but also the workplace. Like many other companies at the time, they introduced a social policy, but the difference was that the social benefits were not just put in place as little bonuses, but as employee rights. While the satisfaction amongst workers was high, Zeiss and Abbe were still missing one last thing in order to fully utilize the benefits of Abbe's theory. Optical glass of the highest quality. With the assistance of the glass chemist Otto Schott, they managed to produce a remarkable optical glass with no impurities by once again using a scientifically substantiated technique. With these components, Zeiss was equipped to produce a perfect instrument. In the years that followed the release of their microscope, demand for the new device remained high, especially amongst medical researchers. The company grew from 25 employees in 1866 to around 1,300 in 1905. Accordingly, Significant breakthroughs were made in chemistry, bacteriology, and medicine, and German medical research was renowned worldwide. Microscopy has been used to see things that are not visible to the naked eye. Many life sciences and healthcare applications still rely on microscopy to a very big extent. Microscopy is ever more important in life sciences. Uh, for example, more than 80% of publications in, in cell biology come with very critical contributions from microscopy. A very well-known example of this is the discovery of the tu tuberculosis bacillus by Robert Koch. After many centuries of speculation about how the nature of this deadly disease, Robert Koch could prove the infection with a microorganism and he could resolve this with a Zeiss microscope. Until today, this microscopy plays a major role in virtually every biological research, for example, in cancer research or Alzheimer, are also still in the research of infectious diseases. In the last century, microscopes have also more and more been used in material sciences to better understand the microscopic structures of different materials. This lays the foundation to engineer novel materials which we need in the future and today with very special properties and of course also to optimize very important devices. Until today, Zeiss provides researchers with the high-end technology they need to conquer unknown scientific territory. The synergy between entrepreneurs and scientists did not only partially pave the way for modern medicine with a perfectly precise microscope, it is what constitutes the spirit, the DNA of Zeiss till this very day. Yet, why is this collaboration so vital for Zeiss's success? When building his company in Jena in 1846, I think the success criteria are the ones that are making us successful today still. And these are curiosity, passion, precision, and from the very beginning, dedication to highest quality. 
These ingredients have fostered innovation that has contributed to scientific understanding and the development of relevant technology in many, many different fields of industry, but also of science. On the other hand, the organizational setup of ZEISS as part of a foundation still enables us, us today to be very long-term focused and constantly develop technologies to meet the evolving needs of the markets of the future, looking forward 10 or 20 years instead of just developing the next microscope. By working closely with the scientists and designing instruments according to their needs, Zeiss has been at the forefront of cutting-edge research and innovation since the introduction of the compound microscope. Just by looking at the evolution of the technology alone, it is obvious that our urge to see more has no limits. You can always come closer, look deeper, and get a better understanding of our life, of our planet. Science and medicine have advanced greatly over the last 175 years, and technological solutions evolved accordingly. Nowadays, most microscopes are huge, complex machines with integrated cameras and software tailored to the needs of the individual research. Just think about it. With a traditional light microscope, you can see the cell of an apple. But with an electron microscope, you can see chromosomes and even atoms up close. I'm very convinced that the limits have actually not been reached until today and there is so much more to come in microscopy in the next decades. Microscopy has been revolutionized several times in the past 175 years and today a modern microscope is a very advanced machine that is a combination of hardware and software. In very early times, um, Zeiss used visible light to make things visible. And today we are using different light sources to characterize the sample in many, many different ways. Since the onset of digitization, research microscopy solutions have incorporated the newest technologies to tackle specific problems, and the new technology allows researchers to see life at the nanoscale. However, if just one hair is as wide as a football field under the electron microscope, it generates huge amounts of data. And humans are not capable anymore of evaluating the data volumes if even simple research questions generate terabytes. Therefore, Albis sees an enormous potential for artificial intelligence in microscopy. Microscopes are getting more and more sophisticated and they of course generate more and more data. And this is why I think the next big thing which is now starting to develop in microscopy is solutions based on artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence uh, will be used a lot for setting up the image. So there is so many parameters you can set up and the users are not that into microscopy very often. So you use intelligence to, to set this up, but also finally to evaluate the picture because the picture you get is normally uh, very complex and to guide the user to where he wants to see some data, uh, you will need artificial intelligence as well. Often, science consists only of numbers and graphs, but imaging systems and microscopy solutions offer a different approach, a picture to tell a story. It offers the possibility to comprehend a disease from a different perspective or to understand the relevance of a very small living organism. To understand the complexity of materials, we need to see their microstructure as the challenges of humankind, like climate change, require sustainable engineering innovations. Okay, so the development in research microscopy is still extremely dynamic. Uh, we see new, totally new microscopes techniques arising for new applications every few years. And there are good examples also now with all this uh, COVID research, for example. And one example here, how we still work with scientists to keep up with the speed of innovation is, for example, the so-called lattice light sheet technology which can be used for very sensitive, ultra-fast imaging of cells at very, very high resolution. And that's exactly what you need to do research today. There are 
endless possibilities to research the human body, to find out more and learn about life. It is unthinkable that we could know everything at one stage. Life in itself is a miracle and we cannot manufacture it. Yet, what drives us is our curiosity to understand life on this planet. And maybe this is our biggest strength, our power to make life on Earth sustainable and peaceful. Today, we have satellites to capture every square meter of our planet. We can look into human bodies, into bones and brains. Orbital telescopes can grasp the depths of space. But we still have an incredible hidden world right next to us, the world ocean. About 71% of the Earth's surface is covered with salt water, and the oceans hold about 96% of our water. Even though the complex ecosystem is essential to our life on Earth, one part of the ocean is still vastly unknown, the deep sea. So we know that uh, there are fewer humans that have been diving to the deep sea than humans that flew to space. And that's amazing to think, wow, I'm one of them. I'm one of those people who under try to understand and explore the deep sea. Antje Boetius is a microbiologist, researcher, professor of geomicrobiology at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology, and director of biosciences and deep sea ecology and technology at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven, Germany. Her groundbreaking discovery of the anaerobic oxidation of methane in microbes opened the door to theories about how life on Earth may have evolved in oxygen-absent environments. The combination of knowledge, technical and social solutions and the feeling of the crisis that is already here mobilizes our energies um, and brings us together as humanity and uh, lets us act uh, for a better future. That's, that's the hope that I have. Every deep sea exploration is a dive into the unknown. It entails seeing something that no other human has seen before every time you dive down into the dark depths. The deep sea, as a myth of the ultimate unknown, has been present in our collective imagination for centuries. Yet, for a long time, the lack of light and oxygen also led to the assumption that life could not exist there. However, Discoveries by researchers, such as Antje Boetius, challenge our limits of imagination. Um, I'm thriving for a deeper understanding. So already as a kid, I was so curious about how the Earth and the oceans function or how people function and why things the, are the way they are. So to me, um, curiosity is actually the, the, the greatest force in, in my being and in my work that I do. But uh, inspiration, yes, it, is, it has to do with uh, wanting to get a fuller picture, wanting to be close to the, the landscapes, the nature I love, which happens to be the deep sea and the oceans. And it's to me an inspiration to dive into a situation where most of my surroundings are unknown. I don't feel this as a threat. I feel this as a great uh, luck. But exploring the unknown does not only involve adventure and discovery. In recent years, it has become increasingly apparent how much of a negative impact humans have on ecosystems and nature. Antje Boetius has participated in around 40 marine biology exploration expeditions and has witnessed how the climate change is affecting the oceans. We see traces of us humans everywhere, be it the littering, be it the effects of climate change, be it the first experiments that we do to harvest metals from the deep sea, uh, be it uh, remnants of fisheries uh, and tracks and traces of disturbances on the seafloor. There are so many changes that we humans brought to the oceans that I knew also my profession will not only be exploring and admiring nature and finding out unknown life and unknown processes, it will also be being an eyewitness to the changes we humans uh, do and also questions of solutions and questions of risks that I have to speak about uh, when it's about the relationship we have to our oceans and polar seas.
When we hear about the melting Arctic ice and the animals that are endangered, we want to save them. And by turning to renewable energies, by reducing our CO2 emissions, we are on the right track. Yet, as a microbiologist, Professor Antje Boetius is also confronted with a whole set of other issues. Tiny invisible particles that pollute our oceans. So most people, when you ask them, they would say, I love the sea, I love being at the coast, I love the oceans, I want the whales to be protected, I want the penguins and the polar bears to be protected. And uh, very often it is hurtful to them to realize that everyone's doing this impacting the ocean already at the global scale. CO2 we've already mentioned, or methane release, there are other parts that are more hidden. For example, our everyday use of disposable plastics, that leaves a big impact on the oceans because the oceans take in uh, materials that are transported by the wind, they take into the precipitation, uh, micro and nanoplastics. And so the way we use um, plastics just means that the ocean gets a buckload of all of that. Every year, at least 8 million tons of plastic end up in our oceans. Before entering the oceans, or once in the water, the plastic breaks up into very small particles, so-called nano or microplastics. Microscopy plays a crucial role in finding and identifying these particles, as with a size of 5 millimeters or even smaller, most of them can only be detected with a microscope. The problem is that the particles can be mistaken for food by marine life. If microorganisms like plankton consume them, they won't be able to survive. Yet, the tiny, light-gathering phytoplankton living at the sea surface are the source of nearly all life in the oceans. They account for approximately 50% of all photosynthesis on Earth. And as oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis, they support every breath we take. With research like this, microscopy can draw awareness to a pressing issue as well as provide the data to make change possible, says Dr. Michael Albitz. I think that the future of this planet and the future of society is driven by, by some very important megatrends. Like aging society, sustainability, including future mobility concepts and the necessity for novel materials in order to build our future. There is a lot of questions coming up, uh, very relevant questions, and we need an even better understanding of microscopic structures to answer these questions in life sciences, in medicine, but also in material sciences. Science can be an effective tool to show that climate change is a major threat for our planet and thus our life. Only because of science, we can understand how important a small microorganism like plankton is for our life or how dangerous a tiny virus. Yet, whereas science can deliver the evidence that there is a real problem, it can also work on solutions and inform the right political decisions. So there is still hope. Working together with dedicated scientists and investing in cutting-edge technology to protect our planet is one thing that can be done. Zeiss will continue to enable researchers to explore the precious life cycles on our planet and work with them on sustainable innovations for a better future. Thank you so much for listening to our first episode of Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this insight into the vision of Zeiss and how research and innovation can help shape our future. Please subscribe, rate, and review us and find out more about our anniversary campaign on our website and social channels. You can find the link in the show notes. This was the first episode of Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast, by the agency Wild Style Network in collaboration with Schönlein Media for the Zeiss Group. Editors, Lina Zopfs. Narrator, Jasmin Blair. Executive producer, Felix Vogelstaller. Line producer, Rebecca Emrich. 
Production Manager Florian Kasten 